a terrifying beast following its instincts, a hotel manager just trying to get his job done. Great villains can get you on their side, no matter how evil their schemes may be. Keep watching to find out who made this list. Comic book movies have often been maligned as lacking in depth, offering surface-level takes on the human experience at best. Black Panther represented a killer blow against that argument, however. An Academy Award nominee for Best Picture that trafficked in serious political issues, all while celebrating African art and history. It also introduced one of the most complex villains in comic book movie history. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? While T'Challa ultimately assumes his place as the King of Wakanda, Eric Killmonger has a legitimate claim to the throne, and he's willing to fight for it too. The differences between the two men are philosophical in nature and deeply complicated. Killmonger doesn't feel that the perfect land of Wakanda should stay isolated from the world when it could use its substantial resources to fight encroaching evil and organize a revolt against the status quo. T'Challa's approach is more noble and compassionate, so he inevitably wins out. Of course, he then allows the deadly climactic events of Avengers Infinity War to take place in Wakanda, something that likely wouldn't have happened under Killmonger's regime. In the world of the Karate Kid, karate is a big deal in the valley area of Southern California, and it's ruled over by the Cobra Kai Dojo and its star pupil, Johnny Lawrence. Johnny is a cocky, talented teenage martial artist willing to do whatever it takes to win, even following the brutal, war-inspired instructions of Kreese, his cold and devious sensei. Johnny's also got a comfortable teen romance going with classmate Ali Mills. But then all of this is threatened by Daniel LaRusso, a new kid in town recently arrived from the East Coast who seems devoted to taking away both Johnny's karate dominance and his girlfriend. The Karate Kid presents Daniel's journey to find purpose and stick up for himself against Johnny and his karate bully minions, who do admittedly deliver a sound and vicious beating against their foe. But as the Cobra Kai series would later show, Johnny had a lot of inner turmoil and plenty of problems at home to boot. He hates Daniel, sure, but that hatred only developed after his adversary arrogantly moved in on his world and his partner. Starship Troopers is a shoot-'em-up sci-fi action movie with a dark side. It's set in the 23rd century, where space travel is easy enough that humanity has entered into a new age of imperialism and colonialism, exploring and taking over distant planets. The United Citizen Federation, a fascistic global governing body fueled by eerie war propaganda, becomes involved with the Bugs, an insect alien species hell-bent on destruction. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part, too. But that's just the propaganda talking. It's only barely alluded to in the movie. But the reason the bugs are so insistent on exterminating human space soldiers is because the humans are hostile invaders. The United Citizen Federation try to conquer their planets, their lands, and their homes. In this sense, the bugs are only defending themselves, and the humans are the true villains of Starship Troopers. Home Alone was a massive blockbuster success, so a sequel was an obvious next step. But it would take some creative thinking to duplicate the unique circumstances that left Kevin McAllister alone at home and fending off a gang of burglars. Home Alone 2, lost in New York, finds Kevin separated from his family on a vacation, alone in Manhattan and avoiding the recently escaped wet bandits. At the same time, Kevin runs afoul of another grown-up, Mr. Hector, the sniveling concierge of the Plaza Hotel, portrayed by Tim Curry. Kevin checks into the legendarily luxurious hotel and runs up a massive bill on his non-present father's credit card. His every action and charge rightfully arouses suspicion on Mr. Hector's part. He's an employee of the hotel, after all, and one who takes his role very seriously. He constantly attempts to catch Kevin in the act of what is essentially identity theft and fraud and is constantly foiled and humiliated. But Mr. Hector is really just trying to protect the hotel and its assets against a rogue kid with a stolen credit card. The Santa Claus is a classic modern-day Christmas movie. A cranky toy company executive, Scott Calvin, attains the roles and responsibilities of Father Christmas after accidentally killing the real deal on Christmas Eve. The Santa Claus was also one of the first family comedies to explore the effects of divorce on parents and their kids. As he gives in to his new role as Santa Claus and coming to magically resemble the big guy, 
Scott's ex-wife and her new husband, Neil, become increasingly concerned that Scott is having a mental breakdown. Neil is a psychiatrist, a modern man of the 90s who is very much in touch with his emotions. Because he's unlike the gruff, macho, and blunt Scott, however, and because he's married to the mother of Scott's son, Scott hates Neil. And so the audience is supposed to hate Neil too. That's unfair though, because Neil is just trying to attend to the mental and social well-being of his stepson, and voice his concern for the boy's father at the same time. Hailed as the first summer blockbuster and a horror classic, Jaws is a masterclass in anticipation, tension, and terror. Set in the perfect beach resort town of Amity Island, the local community is threatened when a shark begins helping itself to a living buffet of tasty, meaty humans. A skeleton crew of salty hunters then heads out into the ocean, determined to kill the shark before it can strike again. They lie in wait, anticipating the attack, and by the time the credits roll, one of the crew is dead along with the shark itself. You could argue that Hooper, Quint, and Brody were acting in preemptive self-defense on behalf of Amity. But it's also true that they were killing a natural predator, one who was merely following its animal instincts. Sharks need to eat meat to survive, and the beast in Jaws simply found a lot of it hanging around on a beach. It didn't act out of spite, vengeance, or some kind of anti-human agenda. The shark just did what sharks are supposed to do. What killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> the Batman films of the 80s and 90s started out dark and became progressively more cartoonish, although their villains grew ever more sympathetic, and the justifications for their destructive actions became more understandable. In 1989's Batman, for example, Jack Nicholson's Joker is a campy, over-the-top, gleeful agent of chaos. By 1997's Batman and Robin, Batman's rogues gallery had been exhausted to the point at which the film's big bads were Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze, characters with very odd powers and backstories more tragic than evil. Botanist Dr. Pamela Isley has a run-in with her superior at a lab owned by Wayne Enterprises and threatens to squeal on his unauthorized development of a dangerous drug. For her efforts, Dr. Isley is subjected to an attack using a toxic substance. Adding insult to the injury he indirectly caused, Bruce Wayne makes an enemy out of Dr. Isley when he rejects her experimental environmental projects. Meanwhile, Batman contends with Victor Freeze, who has placed his wife Nora in deep freeze until he can cure her life-threatening affliction. Poison Ivy unplugs Nora's cryogenic unit and tells Freeze that Batman killed her, tricking the lovesick softy into becoming a revenge-bent villain named Mr. Freeze. Really though, his heart is in the right place. In John Hughes' teen classic high school dramedy The Breakfast Club, there are six main characters, specifically five teenagers and vice principal Richard Vernon. This creates a classic us versus them dynamic between the young and optimistic and the old and cynical. Those kids are forced to spend their Saturday in an in-school suspension for various infractions and rule violations, with Vernon keeping a watchful eye on them and offering a few snide comments in the process. In fact, he generally behaves more like a prison warden than an administrator. Is Vice Principal Vernon the smug, teen-hating jerk that John Hughes wrote him as and how Paul Gleason played him? Absolutely. But Vernon is doing his job and then some. He's also using his Saturday to discipline five very special cases, something he probably didn't have to do in the first place. He obviously cares about students if he's going to go the extra mile like this, and it bears mentioning that he's not just randomly punishing Bender, Claire, Brian, Andrew, and Allison. With the exception of the latter who is kicking it in detention by choice, all of those students did pretty bad stuff deserving of the sentence. One brought a gun to school, for example, and another assaulted a fellow student. They're hardly heroes. Based on a Saturday Night Live sketch about a cable access show shot in a basement, Wayne's World is a self-aware movie about the dangers of success and the destructive appeal of fame. It's a thorough condemnation of selling out, as metalhead goofballs Wayne and Garth learn after agreeing to let yuppie greaseball TV producer Benjamin Kane turn their show into a commercial network affair. Wayne and Garth are blindsided when the new Wayne's World is nothing like their old show with a new theme song and heavy product placement. Maybe I'm wrong on this one, but for me, the beast doesn't include selling out. Putting aside his villainous plan to lure away Wayne's girlfriend, Cassandra, Benjamin is honest with his intentions from his first appearance in the film. He sees the initial low-rent Wayne's World on TV and starts making some calls about acquiring the show and increasing its reach. He then gives Wayne and Garth a contract that presumably lays out everything he planned to do, which they happily sign. Benjamin is a ruthless go-getter of a businessman, sure, but he isn't the least bit evil or secretive about any of his actions. 
in the many adaptations of Rudyard Kipling's 1984 masterpiece The Jungle Book and particularly in Disney's 1967 animated musical adaptation, Shere Khan is the main villain and fearsome king of the jungle. He's the most feared predator in the land despite his innate coolness, charisma, and persuasive nature. He's also a known hunter of humans, which is presented as the ultimate sin to a human audience. When you think about it, though, that's not so much an intentional act of evil as it is relatively normal behavior for a carnivorous jungle cat. Yes, Shere Khan also genuinely hates humans, but he has his reasons for that, too. As a dominant force and leader of the jungle, Shere Khan tries to protect his environment and the animals that live in it. Humans destroy the jungle and its residents, and he knows this. Hence why Shere Khan is terrified of fire and how the humans are able to wield it. Both The Incredibles and its sequel, Incredibles 2, are movies about physically gifted superheroes saving the day. But they're also clever satires of the superhero film genre. Offering up sharp commentary about society's enduring wish for godlike beings to rise up and save us. In the world of Incredibles 2, the cultural pendulum has shifted to the point at which superheroes have long fallen from grace. This leads tech giant Winston Dever and his sister Evelyn to recruit Elastigirl to regain the public's trust and faith in superheroes. However, Evelyn Dever is also the villain of the film. Under the name Screenslaver, she devises a plan to mass hypnotize superheroes and force them to commit acts of evil and destruction. This is intended to demonstrate how it's dangerous and unwise to re-legalize supers, a group that could theoretically use their supreme gifts for wicked purposes. Evelyn really isn't a villain. She's simply pointing out that unchecked privilege and unlimited power is the true threat to society. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.